Okay, well, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for being here today. I'm super excited about this opportunity and this panel discussion. Um, you are part of Leading the Fight, Women and the Pandemic. And I am Endia D. Cordova. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Development um, and Strategic Initiatives at the Yukon Foundation. And I am proud to moderate today's conversation. Today's program is brought to you by the Yukon Alumni Office and the Yukon Foundation's Women in Philanthropy Network. The Women in Philanthropy Network was created in 2016 in recognition of the power of women. We know that women are leaders at home, in the workplace, and throughout society. And our goal of creating this network was to help transform Yukon by harnessing their leadership in the realm of philanthropy. So we are excited that we have this panel of rock star women who I'm gonna have them introduce themselves in a moment. But this panel, just to give you some background, will last about an hour and will include some time for Q&A. Throughout the conversation, please feel free to submit questions because we really want you to be part of the conversation. And I'll do my best to address as many questions on our end. Hopefully as the conversation uh, goes on, you'll hear some of your questions um, answered as well. We hope that this conversation will shed light on the unique challenges that women face as leaders in a society designed and oftentimes for men and where the stereotypical vision of leadership does not look like a woman. Many women have convinced themselves that we do not belong in the rooms that we're in. Um, and we oftentimes believe that our voices do not matter. We all understand that leadership is hard and convincing others and oftentimes, sometimes ourselves, that we possess the answers and are capable of affecting real change requires confidence, insight, and guts. And these ladies, they have all of that. They are confident. They have a, they brought a tremendous amount of insight in terms of leading their industries. And they have a tremendous amount of guts and grit to get through the stuff that they're getting through. Our conversation today brings together four rock star women leading in industries that have been highly impacted by the pandemic. And we want to highlight this conversation is multidimensional as we refer to the pandemic. So the pandemic is not just about COVID-19, the COVID-19 virus, although it really is the, 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 the core of where we started here. But our society is currently wrestling with the duality of combating the, the virus and also facing the truth regarding the inherent racism and racial discrimination that plagues our nation. Leaders in every industry are facing mounting pressures to relate to combating the virus, addressing the anti-racism social movement, finding solutions right now for the foreseen economic uncertainty, and also addressing um, equitable health care across the board, just to name a few of the complexities that they're faced with right now. So it's really important to highlight these various issues as part of our conversation because we, as we think about leaders and especially leaders that are women and or women of color, these leaders are uniquely positioned to handle these complexities. Research has shown that leaders, women leaders, have been more resolved, more result and in affecting uh, change. They have been able to assess evidence and heed to expert advice. And they've also been able to make decisions more decisively oftentimes than our male counterparts. So women leaders are achieving great success and you'll hear from them today. But we also know that there's still a lot of work to be done to transform our organizations in society so that it could reflect more women leaders across the board. So let's jump into the conversation. So I would like to introduce you to our panelists. I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves and provide a little brief snapshot on what you currently do, how your industry has been impacted by the pandemic and the anti-racism social movement and any um, opening thoughts that you would like to share with our audience today. So let's start with Lori. Lori, I know you've been leading HR efforts at Otis since the start of, pan of the pandemic. Um, and because Otis has a manufacturing lo location in Wuhan, please share with us, how are you doing? A little bit about what you do and how are you facing um, and addressing the pandemic at this time? 
Sure, absolutely, and thank you. And I mean, I just want to start by saying thanks for the opportunity um, to talk with you all today and to be part of a group of such distinguished uh, women that are on the panel joining me. I'm, I'm humbled uh, by the the other women uh, leaders that are that are on the panel. Um, in terms of Otis, we're we're uh, a gl truly global company. We have 69,000 employees. You mentioned about 600 of our employees are in Wuhan, China. We have 15,000 employees in China and about 600 of them were in Wuhan. So we've lived, um, we've watched this pandemic uh, move around the globe. And it's it's been really fascinating because um, we're very fortunate to have at Otis uh, a female CEO, Judy Marks, my boss. Um, and Judy and I receive and have asked to receive every day notes whenever any one of our 69,000 employees becomes infected or test positive. And it's, um, I could not watch the news for a month and know exactly what's going on because we're, we see employees test positive in the places where, um, wh where the, the, the virus is spreading quickly. Um, for us in China, um, things really hit hard right around Chinese New Year. Um, so we had some very early, very difficult decisions to make because we had a lot of the leadership team um, takes time outside of China um, for the Chinese New Year break. So we had a whole bunch of our expatriates from the US that had traveled either home to their countries or to vacation spots. And while they were, uh, while they were out of the China, the US government issued an advisory for US citizens not to travel into China. So we had to decide how to, you know, we had executives and their families, you know, that we needed to decide what do we do. And interestingly, all of the executives really wanted to go back and be with their teams. They felt and passionately that they did not want to leave the, their teams in China and be absent. So the vast majority chose to go back to China and have their families uh, come back home. And um, you know that was one of the first crisis points. We've seen it really, um, you know, move around the world. Obviously, some terribly challenging times with Spain and Italy. Um, right now, India and obviously the the U.S. is a real concern because we're seeing um, a, a good deal of the states, and we certainly see with our employees, you know, the activity creeping up again. Um, so it's been a challenge. It's been. Uh, we spun. We were owned uh, by United Technologies. We were part of a much larger entity. And our spin day, we became independent. We started trading as a publicly traded company on April 3rd. So UTC had done this all kinds of contingency planning around readiness for the spin. But, and, and UTC is really great at contingency planning. But they never considered a global pandemic and how that you know we would try to be ready so our first several board meetings we've done by telephone as opposed to in person we've done earnings calls we've you know we, we we've had different classes of employees because we have mechanics in wuhan that were maintaining the elevators in the hospitals that were treating the sickest patients and they needed to be there and so we've got different types of employees that have different abilities to um, work remotely and, and it's challenged our thinking. And you know, we've learned a lot from it and we certainly learned a lot from China and the China team, you know, when, when things started to spread into Europe and the Americas, the China team hosted a number of calls saying, here's the things that really matter to our people, to keeping people well. You know, one of the things I'm certain, really proud of is we have very, very few cases where our employees are infecting each other. We have a great process in place of tracking and keeping, um, keeping our employees as safe as we can. So um, I've been at UTC for a good portion of my career. I actually started out as a lawyer straight out of law school. I am a double dog husky, as I call it, UConn undergrad, uh, business business undergrad focus and I graduated from the law school in 1994 um, and so kind of grew up at UT spent some time about five years at Aetna which was great totally different industry 
great experience, great learnings for me. I, I love the opportunity to, you know, land in different universes and learn how to, uh, to test myself and grow and contribute. So uh, I'm delighted to be here. I think, you know, the Otis experience, there'll be a lot I can talk about as we ask more questions, but I want to allow my other uh, co-panelists to introduce themselves. Fantastic. Thank you, Lori. And next, I'll ask Martha to introduce herself. If you could share a little bit about your background and how you have been able to equip yourself uh, in terms of the, the pandemic with your, with, within your industry. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be with you all. Uh, I share Lori's sentiments. It's wonderful to be in this group. Um, well, we are, my current company is headquartered in Miami, Florida. And so you might imagine that presents all sorts of challenges and we deal in leisure travel. So probably the biggest intersection of disruption that you might imagine from a discretionary um, life perspective. I am uh, similar to Lori in a UConn grad, obviously, uh, engineering background. I've worked in technology my entire career, almost over 30 years now, amazingly, and um, started at a telecom, a local Connecticut-based telecom company, SNET at the time, moved on to GE, uh, worked in the GE Capital Financial Services Division, then went on to Starwood Hotels, and then most recently over the last two and a half years, been with Royal Caribbean Cruises. We own four brands. We have, a, like Lori was saying, a very global workforce, uh, very global product. We had the recent highlights that we can get into India as, as we get into the conversation of um, zero revenue, essentially, because we've stopped operations as of mid-March. We had to repatriate 80,000 crew members around the world to 126 countries, all of which have different levels of restrictions on either the sending governments or the receiving governments. And um, now have to rethink what our mission is in the short term uh, until we can, re we can resume sale and resume operations. So all forms of complexity, we can get into it as the conversation evolves. Thank you, Martha. Thank you so much. And I'm going to ask Elise now to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about your background, um, the pandemic, and how you're handling also the anti-racism movement at this point. Uh, my name is Elise Frelichardi. I am the medical director at the University of Connecticut Health Center out in Farmington, Connecticut of the emergency department. Um, I'm an emergency physician by trade. I went, I'm a UConn lifer, um, UConn undergrad, UConn Medical School and UConn Residency, um, worked for about seven years at Hartford Hospital for the UConn Emergency Medicine Residency and then moved back over to Farmington, back to UConn Health in 2016. Um, I took over as medical director in August, thinking it would be you know, a nice transition year of smooth training and sailing, learning how to be the medical director. Um, and yeah, no, in February, it all blew up. So everything we knew in emergency medicine kind of changed. So we're faced with a virus with no treatment, no real diagnostic tests, no real cure, um, no knowledge of what's going on other than what I found on Twitter. So you're, you're faced with a disease that you have no information on. And Everybody is scared. And my job, essentially, I have three parts to my job. I am the operations director for the emergency department. So I have to make sure patients are getting what they need and that my staff is getting what they need. I teach medical students and residents, which also was completely upended during the pandemic. And then I work clinically as an emergency physician. So I do the job that I supervise everybody else doing. So it's kind of a three-part deal, and every single part was impacted in ways we couldn't even imagine. So patients are sick and stressed and dying, and we are making decisions about them that we should never have to make. Um, my staff is sick. Not, my staff didn't get very sick, but they were stressed, and their well-being is of utmost importance. So that was a huge element of what I had to do throughout this pandemic was make sure that I was taking care of the group of people that I was overseeing, making sure they had everything they needed. 
um, laying down every single day on the ground, making sure that they have the PPE they need, um, making sure that they have the operational plans they need and updating them more than they probably needed, but it was important to be transparent so they were not stressed about that. So, um, in, you know, as this went along and New England was lucky because we had great leadership and the, the um, COVID cases have been on a nice steady decline. So this, this early summer has been nice getting back to more of a normal system with things changed quite a bit. We, you know, take full precautions with everybody, but the social unrest that has been brought to the forefront is we are on the front lines of that as well. So we in healthcare, um, we are not, strangers to knowing that we have a unfair healthcare system that needs to look inward and fix our own house first. We, um, we don't provide equal care to people of color versus people who are white who walk through the door. Um, so we, we see the unrest people are feeling, patients are feeling every day facing that um, and how we are going to address that. But we also, we have noticed that the, the patients coming in are at their wit's end. Um, they're just dealing with this social unrest on a daily basis. They're dealing with being, you know, in their houses and not socializing and not having outlets. So they're coming in and they're on their worst day, but we've seen a lot more aggressiveness towards staff, a lot of um, aggressiveness. We've had many more incidents to, for, with our providers and nurses of color being attacked uh, verbally by patients. We get physically attacked sometimes, that happens too, but that we have not seen an uptick in. But just people are extremely stressed and how as a leader do we deal with that? How do we balance that? Because these are uncharted waters. Um, how, we need to provide an environment where our workers can come to work every day and feel safe and secure and take care of patients. So it's been a trip um, for the last six months as a, as a leader and a newer leader in healthcare. Um, but I've learned a ton and there's a silver lining to everything. So um, we are, we are you know, working hard and making sure that we can take care of our patients and our staff appropriately. Fantastic. Thank you, Elise, for that. We're going to go a little bit into, you know, telling us how you navigated all that. But um, I'm not going to have our final panelist, Bongi, introduce herself. Um, she's in a unique situation as well and would love to share a little bit about your background and also how your industry is ma managing the pandemic at this time and the anti-racism movement as well. Bongi, you're on mute. I saw that. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, okay. So Bongi and I'm the commissioner of the Connecticut DMV. I was appointed by the governor over a year ago. Prior to taking over this position, I was actually retired for six years uh, from Aetna. And um, although Lori was there, we never met face to face, but I was um, at, with Aetna over 30 years. Since um, taking over the DMV, it has been quite an experience. Uh, my entire management team um, was affected by COVID. Uh, out of nine people in the room, it just so happened that the one day that we got together, um, a member of the team had COVID. So the entire management team around March 10th found out. And so we had to immediately um, um, shut down for two weeks. We um, work from home for two weeks. And so you can imagine, you don't know what's going on, yet you are an agency that is critical to many key moments in people's lives. And so we had to keep operations. So those, for those two weeks, we closed. And then we came back with a very limited staff. And most of the staff was uh, the, the, what, what we call the back office staff because the front end retail staff just could not go back, come back in. And so we immediately changed our delivery model. We moved to submitting documents by phone, by Dropbox. And so in the past three months, we have radically changed how we do business. On a monthly basis, we used to get 115 um, people walking in because by statute, we actually have to transact business in person because our key mission is to ensure that who we're providing um, credentials to is the right person. So 
we needed citizens to walk into our offices in order for us to uh, pre provide them with those credentials. So what we've done is we really are very, very dependent on, on transforming how we deliver DMV services. And we're looking at um, online, we're moving our, um, a lot of our transactions online. We are leveraging the phone. Prior to pre-COVID, we had literally no work at home. We were able to move everyone home. We have really transformed, but it's been very, very, um, very, very stressful in terms of just getting used to the new way of working. As we, as you know, we're state government and it's not very easy to change, but I have to say we responded uh, very quickly in terms of knowing that at one point within the agency, we thought of ourselves as, you know, whether it's an essential agency, but our staff was non-essential, which meant when there was a snowstorm, people stayed home. So imagine we're, we're now changing and rethinking who's essential, who's not, how do you come in? We've been very fortunate that we were able to partner with our unions as we made this transition. And at the end of the day, the most important job one for me is the safety of our employees and the safety of the general public. There's a lot more that we do, but I'll share as we go along because I know um, we want to get to the questions, but um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be part of this group. Um, 30 years in Aetna and um, as women, those were very different days and I'm not going to uh, out myself, but when I was at UConn, we did not have cell phones, no internet, uh, no work at home. And so it is really exciting to be here with um, this um, set of with, with these women and I'm looking forward to the discussions that we're going to have. Fantastic. Thank you, Bongi. So ladies, I would love to hear how your UConn education prepared you um, for your career journey. There are many, um, if not all of the participants today on the call are UConn connected, UConn alum, um, UConn employees. We'd love to hear how you feel your education at UConn helped you. If you can answer that question in like two to three minutes, that'll be fantastic. I'm gonna start with Martha. Um, tell us a little bit about how your UConn experience, your UConn education prepared you to handle what you're dealing with right now. I think for me, the biggest thing, you know, forgetting discipline and, and the depth that you learn about in your discipline is really problem solving. Uh, I think in the introductions, the biggest thing that you heard us all say is these are not playbooks that have been written in any industry, in any context. And being able to problem solve and attack, break down problems logically, thematically, learn to make mistakes, learn to pivot from your mistakes are an immense part of an education that, again, outside of discipline, because we all have different disciplines, um, I think are incredibly valuable and is something that lives with you in a lot in a lifetime. One of my favorite UConn professors, Keith Barker, I met with him maybe a year or two ago. And I said, what do you see as the biggest difference today versus when I might have had you in school, which was similar to Bongi pre-cell phone. <laughs> uh, and he said, problem solving you know, the methods and approaches to problem solving. So I think that's a bigger issue that we need to think about as leaders, as parents, as citizens. How do we want to attack problem solving? Because these kinds of crises will change, we'll, we'll be confronted with different problems, but how we solve for them is critically important. That sounds great. Um, Elise, tell us about your how your education has helped you. So we know that you're, I think, born and raised at UConn, it sounds like. <laughs> yes. I have a couple of careers at UConn. Education. I, 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 I got a master's from Colorado State and an MBA from UMass, so I did grant Okay, out. okay so you're not all the way to UConn. But. Not, not fall, but mostly. <laughs> um, basically, I mean, UConn from the very beginning, it, it, I loved undergrad, I loved med school. It, the diversity of thought, the diversity of opinions that I got exposed to, it's a large, far-reaching organization that you can pretty much find your niche no matter what. So that was the kind of the, the biggest thing beyond problem solving because that from the very get-go was an emphasis from undergrad and beyond. 
Um, but just having people around you that are supportive and there's not a, um, a snobbiness, a, a everybody's approachable and you know, I get answers by email immediately from the ground up. So I was able to find great mentorship and able to really push and find my niche and really have a um, make my way and have good leadership and, you know, ability to look up to people. So I think, I think UConn, I mean, I credit them for quite a bit in my career right now. So. Fantastic. What about you, Lori? How has your UConn experience helped you navigate Otis? So, so for me, it's like I have part one and part two. Part one is my, my undergrad experience. And I mean, I think, I think both Martha and Elise hit on a couple of the key points that I, I, I'm going to talk about. But I mean, undergrad, it was like I learned, um, and it's, you know, kind of in your own journey of life, you know, you're learning to be independent. So, I mean, forget everything you learn. Um, from UConn, like there was envi an environment that was provided to me that forced and allowed me to start really making big decisions for myself and, um, you know, live with them and learn how to live with them. And so um, I actually started as a political science major. I loved to read. I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. Political science was incredibly comfortable for me. You know, I, I loved it. And about two and a half years into my undergraduate degree, I realized I don't want to go straight to law school. I've kind of been in school for a long time and I'd like to take a little bit of time and just work, you know, and see what the world looks like. And so I decided to switch my, my, my major and moved into the business school. And that was really uncomfortable for me. You know, I'm someone who's fortunate often in that you know, so certain classes come really easily to me and political science was just, it, I was happy, it was fun, it was a blast, um, but it was very comfortable. And when I moved into business and now I'm learning, you know, accounting and finance and things that are absolutely brand new to me, um, that was incredibly important. You know, making, you know, allowing me to fail. I tend to be highly competitive and I like to do really well, you know, not getting an A on every test because I had to learn how to think differently when I was thinking in a business context as opposed to my political science. I mean, I remember early in my career writing and I, then I went to law school and I think law school taught me how to spot problems, how to solve problems, how to scenario plan. And, um, you know, I had one of my bosses very early in my career say to me, I don't know what they taught you in law school, but it's so desirable what you have. Try and teach as many people as you can how to do that because it's really issue spotting. Knowing an issue is there is, it, it, it is half the battle. And so many people can become really focused on the work they're doing and not notice those issues that can grow into really big issues if they go untreated. So, you know, I think the second part of my career at the law school, which was a much smaller environment, very much about issue spotting, problem solving, and thinking about what I'll call the second and third level implications of a decision I make. A decision I make that might seem very safe and very wise if I don't think about, you know, how does it flow out or how does it trickle down to the organization? Um, you could have outcomes that you don't look for at all. And I think the law school really kind of, we, we did a lot of learning through reading cases and um, the facts and the holdings and you kind of learn, oh, you wanna try and pre pre prevent as many unintended consequences as you can from your actions. And so, uh, you know, both have been incredibly powerful uh, for me. Great, thank you, Lori. Bongi, same question. How has the UConn experience or education helped you in your career? So you, before UConn, um, I come from a family of four girls and my father basically made all of our decisions. And the first major decision I made um, was to actually participate in a um, sit-in at the UConn library where the black students were fighting for many things, including addressing professors whose um, body of work was racist, uh, looking for uh, an African-American cultural center, 
And so that was the first decision that I actually made where I said, what, what will my father say if I do this? And I said, you know what? I'm going to make this decision. I'm going to live with the consequences. And so that to me was a pivotal moment for me. And then as I went through the four years, I was a math major. And back then there were very few people of color in the math classroom. And in the early years, I was so afraid to walk into a room of 500 people and see no brown faces. Over time, I said, you know what? I need to focus on the future that I want. So I also learned to be brave because um, I was quite a nervous person. I was uh, afraid to actually raise my hand in school because when we moved from Africa, I thought my accent was weird. And so I was, I was an extremely silent person. And so thanks to Yukon, I found my voice. I, I, although we came from South Africa, I actually recognized the importance of social justice, of taking a stand, and of really going after what you believe. And so it was quite a pivotal moment for me, and I, I will always look back at UConn. In fact, in fact, I should say that I actually grew up in stores, Connecticut. So I did live in stores, one of the few black girls at E.O. Smith. And so this whole idea of being the only and having to really trust yourself, trust what you say, and stand behind what you believe is what I, I, I took away from UConn and growing up in Source, Connecticut, with just me and my sisters as the only black girls in the entire school. That's fantastic. And I think all of you for your, for your comments, because it sounds like, you know, mentorship, concise decision-making, problem solving, finding your voice, trusting who you are, being brave are all the things that you gathered from your experience at UConn, which kind of leads me to my next question because all of your industries are known to be traditionally male dominant, right? So we know that men are pretty much running your industry. But as women, we need to be both competent and confident in our decision making, as well as show empathy. There's a, there's a, there's a way that if you're not as um, soft, you're, you get the other type of word in terms of who you are, you know? And so I would love to hear how you're able to skillfully navigate those types of scenarios as a, as a female leader? And do you find that you have to really fight harder to get decisions made um, from male counterparts or defend your decisions because you are a female? So all the things you've learned, how are you navigating that in these male dominated industries? How do you stand confident in your voice and continue to move forward? Um, I'll start with Lori, and then I'll go to Elise, Martha, and Bongi. And if you could each answer that question in one or two minutes, that would be fantastic. So, so, so thanks. Thanks. Um, I think, you know, for me, I grew up um, at a big corporation um, in a world that was most of the leadership teams I would interact with were almost entirely male. Um, very early in my career, I was put in the job of running benefits for the corporation. And as part of that, I had the opportunity to present to our CEO and President's Council, which was the presidents of all the business units and all the directs of the CEO on our benefit strategy and design. And I did that quite regularly. We were a self-insured plan. So it was almost like running a business because our medical plan had you know, so many participants in it. And so our leadership team was really uh, very interested in understanding what we were doing. It was at a time um, when trend, medical trend was running double digits, 15, 16% and completely unpredictable. So it was on the radar screen. And I used to present to the President's Council. And in fact, our CFO at the time said to me, Lori, you are our most frequent visitor this year which um, you know, is not something you usually want to, to be. You feel like you know, people say, I want visibility. And I say, visibility is exposure. And it can go good or it can go poorly. And so you know, it's great, but you need to be prepared. And you need to tell a story that people believe in. What I found at first when I would walk into President's Council, and I was the only woman in the room when I did, and I only walked in to present and then walked out, um, I would wear 
a pantsuit. Um, I don't wear pantsuits, but I wore a pantsuit. And I think it was, you know, me unintentionally and without a real awareness, trying to look like everyone else in the room. I learned how to present and, and people, my team will say now to me, Lori, you know, you're doing your president's council voice. And, you know, I learned how to present in this very monotone flat, no emotion, no, you see my hands, no hand gestures, you know, sit straight, flat voice present. And, um, you know, it was well received. I got invited back and back and back. But I, what I ultimately realized was, you know, I wasn't being myself. And for me, the most important uh, adjective that someone can use to describe me is genuine. And so I, I decided to stop doing that um, and go into President's Council and be Lori. And you know what? After I did that, one of our presidents of our business units who could really give lots of negative people to feedback to people came outside afterwards and said, Lori, that was really terrific. We heard your voice. You have strong opinions. Don't be afraid to use your voice, share your opinions. And since then, you know, I really tried very hard to remind myself that I should never hide the fact that I'm a woman. Um, I should be proud of the fact that I'm a woman. And when I'm a, in a, a woman in a group, I did labor negotiations. The union did not know what to do with me. You know, the Teamsters had, didn't know what to do with me. And I used to started wearing pink sweater, pink cardigans and high heels to our bargaining sessions. And you know what? It threw them way off balance. Then they start opening. They didn't know what to do. And, you know, I learned just be true to yourself. Be true to, true to being a woman and recognize that the voice that you bring is a really important voice to bring to the table. And I think people value it and recognize it. And we just have the confidence, we need to have the confidence to use it. Thank you, Lori. Elise? Sure. So healthcare, there's no doubt that it's a male dominated industry that any leader in healthcare has been a male. That is what is all over the walls at the hospitals and healthcare centers. So um, there's no doubt that, you know, we're, we face an uphill climb as leader, female leaders, but kind of building off what Lori said, I have discovered that being myself and being strong and confident in myself and um, being my compassionate, empathetic self has actually helped significantly as I try to get my point across because people do respond to kindness for the vast majority of time and they do respond to empathy and making connections. And that's what I'm good at. I'm an emergency physician. I have to make good, quick connections and get people to trust me. And so whether I'm presenting things um, to leadership above me or I'm, I'm um, taking care of my staff below me, being empathetic, being a listener, being compassionate has, has changed the game. And through COVID, we've seen this too, right? My, I needed to take care of my staff. I needed to listen to them. I needed to see are you having childcare issues at home that you're not telling me about? Do you need a day off that you won't ask for help, especially my female physicians won't ask for help? Um, so we, I think embracing your own personality and occasionally, you know, we do, I do run into um, like misogyny or paternalism and you just have to face it with calling it out and saying what it is. And when somebody is not listening to you, sometimes you have to say it in a different way or say it louder. Um, and I, I just embracing yourself and being, being utilizing women's strengths, which thankfully are becoming more apparent as we talk about them more and seeing that we don't need to shy from ourselves or constantly be um, guard up and not able to smile and be happy and you know, show our strengths. I think that's great, Elise. I feel like, you know, as we're starting to move and pay more attention to diversity and such, different voices, different personalities, different styles are all going to soon be welcomed at the table. So thank you for that perspective, Elise and Lori. Martha and Bongi, same question. The idea of a male-dominated industry, how are you able to navigate? How are you using your voice 
Um, and do you find that you have to work a little harder to get decisions made, especially in the pandemic? Are people second guessing your judgment because you're a woman? Um, we'd love to hear more about that. Martha, can you start? I would less focus on not listening so much at this point in my career. I, I think it's it changes over time. Uh, and building off of what Lori and Elise said, I, I couldn't agree more. I think authentic leadership is what resonates the best. You have to be authentic to yourself and find what works for you. You know, copying somebody else's style, male, female, black, white, it doesn't matter. It, it just doesn't work and it's unsustainable over time, I think what is best is to focus on what works and get feedback of what doesn't work. I think also we, we can all believe in ourselves and all require a form of input to evolve and to learn, to learn from what works. Um, I think there are tremendous strengths that we have, um, multi, tasking, let's call that one out, um, to be a little, you know, different than empathy, although both are incredibly important. And those are strengths that are gender sort of more obvious in gender, um, women gender than, than in male gender. But listen, you use what you have in your toolkit and you learn from others. I'm an inordinate observer of people. I love watching. I think it's fun. I think it's interesting. And you equally learn from what works as much as what doesn't work in others. Um, you know, all those boss stories that, you know, the, the people that you have not enjoyed working for are tremendous points of learning of what not to do when you're in that same position or how to stand up, like Elise was saying, and have your voice heard and not be silent in the background. Um, I would say stereotypically for women, one of the other things is we're, we're quieter. Um, Elise mentioned it. We don't ask as much. We don't boast as much. We're not out in the center as much. Not that we're not, but we just tend not as much. And I think those are important points of feedback to, to be aware of and to ask, you know, and make sure that you're, you're being seen and heard and the messages are landing. Perfect. Thank you, Martha. And Bongi? So as both a black, as, as being a minority and a, and a woman, I really couldn't speculate on either because I would have twisted myself around an axle. So I really focused on when I would go into meetings or any situation was, did I achieve the result that I went into to achieve? Did I communicate? And I took responsibility for ensuring that I determined what I was going to work on rather than what other people's um, reaction to me as a black woman were. And so if I was in a meeting and I said something and somebody seems to bypass what I said, I would say, was my communications not clear? Because if it wasn't, I'm happy to repeat what I said, or if somebody else repeated something that the entire room ignored, I would say, I'm happy that you agree with what I said earlier. Now, how do we, so, it, so in taking back my power, I was able to actually use whatever these events were in rather than victimi victimizing myself further, I focused on strengthening whatever I felt resulted in whatever reaction that I received that I did not want to receive. So I just think, as certainly for women of color, we can't afford to speculate. It has to be real, it has to be fact-based. We need to take on what we can handle. Folks who can't deal with us, that's their problem, not ours. And so the, you really have to just take back your power and figure out, okay, I went in there, I was a little weak on this and I was a little afraid, or I used my girly voice in trying to do this, or you know what, I should have been stronger and challenged and so all of these interactions um, are more of an opportunity to learn, and that's how you control your destiny in those situations. Fantastic. So I'd love for all of you to, first of all, let's take back our power. I love that, Bongi. I think that's something that we should always be thinking about, um, no matter where you sit in an organization. Take your power back, right? And so I would love for all of you to really think about 
the pandemic and your industry and the, the, the backdrop of the social issues that are happening, but internally the social things that are happening with your employees. So how are you managing the social things that are happening outside, right? So the pandemic, the, the racial unrest, but then internally work-life balance. You have employees that are working at home, Zoom meetings, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours a day. How are you managing that as a leader? How are you balancing that? How are you balancing priorities? And what do you see as your, your role in terms of enacting real change um, during this time? So I'm gonna start with Bongi and Martha. So I'm gonna go re reverse the order. So we can go with Bongi first. Um, I know it's a complex question and we probably have like a few more minutes before we open it up for Q&A. So this will be our speed round. So if you could just tell me a little bit about the social constraints behind you, the outside, what's happening outside, what's happening inside, and how are you managing that as a leader? It's a very difficult balance. And so for me, the priority continues to be the safety of the employees and the general public and being cognizant that not everybody has similar situations that they come from. So we have to be very focused on supporting our employees as we think about they have underlying health issues, they've got children at home, they've got family members that they're taking care of. So we're balancing all of that and what it's causing and forcing us to do is really rethink our service delivery model. The social unrest uh, is, is there, but it's, we see everybody. So it's with us every day. We um, support um, public, uh, with, with people who come here as un, you know, un, undocumented and we have to give them ID. So we've always have to be cognizant of just the, the, the challenges. And so as an agency, we are looking at training, but in terms of the day-to-day, -day, I don't think we've done a good job in, you know, kind of helping employees um, address and deal with those issues. But what we are doing is transforming the, how we work. We are thinking our, about ourselves as a retail front end where we can do better and will do better around customer service making sure that we really understand that people come from different situations. And it forced us to really recognize the value of the credentials that we provide in enabling people to work and many other really important life events. And they were starting to look at the back office as more of a Amazon-like production where we had to rethink, like, do we really need to work from eight to four because we find that mothers are, you know, a challenge with children. So it is turned everything that we do upside down and we are rethinking how do, how, what will we look like when we really go back to, it won't be normal, but the new world. And I think the new world is going to be much more sensitive to women and their needs. Um, once upon a time it, within our branch offices, I have to say, if you were two minutes late, it was an issue. And I said, wait a minute, women with children to be held to a five minute if you're late. So it, like I said, it's a challenge. We are learning, we're doing the best that we can, but I'm not sure that we've won the battle yet. And so we continue to learn every single day, but uh, technology is going to be really where we're going in terms of um, the future of the DMV. That's great. And, and it's kind of too soon to judge how, how good you're doing, but I, I feel super excited about the idea that in a state agency, you're able to make real change and, and have those change happen in real time. So thank you, Bongi. Martha, tell us a little bit about how you're balancing and managing the social issues outside and inside of your organization. You know, I think the biggest thing right now uh, is we've impacted so many workers and so many working lives and folks who, whose livelihood has been disrupted because tourism has been disrupted. And so that's a tremendous impact to our crew who are all furloughed. It's a tremendous impact to the ecosystem that services our industry. And so I think here's you know, a tremendous learning for us in, in terms of empathy, reaching out, checking on neighbors, doing the citizen of the world thing, um, even though it's remote, uh, we've been doing a lot more listening, a lot more outreach, a lot more 
uh, checking in on people, making sure things are okay, making sure where we might lend an ear, a shoulder, uh, or something of more substance of assistance because we need to help each other. There is no other somebody that's going to help. So um, we've tried to create more of that community. I think that's important at this time and just showing our own humanality of it. You know, we don't have the answers. Uh, we're equally scared as leaders and confused and we need to to rely on that, again, that authenticity of each other to say, how do we work this out together? Here's our best thinking today and tomorrow it might change because we learned something new. And that flexibility, I think, may be something that we all can take with us out of this pandemic, that we have to be flexible in our work approach, in our processes, in things that we thought were givens that now have been disrupted. Fantastic. Thank you, Martha. Elise? Yeah, I mean, I think that I addressed earlier, like staying on top of my group and making sure that they are healthy and emotionally safe and secure, I think has been the biggest thing that we probably didn't do so much of before the pandemic kind of occurred. Um, as for talking about social issues and racism and all elements of my job, I think that we are seeing a movement in healthcare where healthcare leaders recognize that it's nobody else's job to address this. This is our job every day to figure out how we can promote equity and diversity in our healthcare system. And we have to do it on the clinical side for our patients. We have to make sure that our employees are experiencing equitable workforce where they're not subject to racism. We have to make sure our medical students and residents are, are getting the education they need in an environment where they're safe and they're not subject to racism on a daily basis. We need to address the structural issues of not promoting people of color, um, not having a diverse workforce. So this is nobody else's job. And I think a lot of times it gets pushed to the side as, you know, it's a little pet project that's on the side. And I have loved the last two months where we've gotten to bring it to the forefront of meetings. We have individual meetings with administrators I may not have gotten to interact with before because this is so important. And I think my goal right now is to make projects that are self-sustaining. So no matter what comes to the forefront in another month or two, that we're still making this our primary effort. So I think that as a leader, that's been um, an exceptional thing to experience. And I, I, I want it. This is my career, right? Like I'm in the midst of it. I have, this is my priority. Fantastic. I feel your energy is coming across. I'm like, yes, I want to be at that table too. That's awesome. And Lori, let us know about your situation in terms of managing the pandemic. How are you supporting work-life balance for your employees? How are you handling work-life balance? And how are you managing with the, the social issues that are happening outside uh, with the, with the racial unrest? Sure, let me, let me start with social justice and Black Life Matters because that's something that I'm incredibly passionate about. And what I see is a moment to rally our organization and act. And we started, and Judy, our CEO, wrote a letter to our employees um, when, when, when this first kind of came on to the, um, came on to the forefront, she wrote a letter to our employees that I was so proud of. It was, you know, it was open, it was honest, it was authentic, it was committed, it was all of those things. Our employees really loved it. But then with a week, within a week, we were like, okay, that's really nice, but what are we going to do? What are we going to do to act differently? And so I'm really excited because, well, I, I, I'm the chief people officer, right? So a lot of times people look to HR. I don't think this is, uh, to Elise's point, I don't think this is an HR issue. I think it's a leadership issue. I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, I do, I am the executive chair of our Momentum Group, which is our people of color employee resource group. They have been amazing for me over the past few weeks because they have a lot of ideas. They feel comfortable and confident bringing forward ideas. We have Shelly Stewart, who's a black member of our board of directors, who's speaking with the Momentum leadership this week. I have a presentation to our executive leadership team tomorrow where we're signing the Judy and all of her direct reports are signing a commitment to change. And it's six things that we've committed to do. 
differently as a result of this. And one of them is to do an assessment of how do we stand in terms of, do we have parity in pay? Do we have parity in hiring? Do we have parity in development opportunities? You know, one of them is around mental health. And are we, you know, providing mental health resources for all of us during these times where, you know, my mom, who's 84, needed to get a COVID test. She needed it to be, she was having some outpatient surgery. She needed it to be um, one of those rapid tests. And so, you know, I couldn't get a test. I finally got one scheduled. And then the testing center in New Haven was closed because of protests in New Haven. And I said to my 84-year-old mom, did you ever think you'd be living in a world where we can't get you your COVID test, which you would never have known about, to do your surgery? Because there's protesting, you know, in New Haven, there's so much going on that is impacting each and every one of us. I'm, I'm enormously passionate about mental health. I think we all need to be um, really um, careful in, in looking at our own mental health, but also of our employees. It's a lot that everyone's dealing with all at the same time in a way that I can't remember ever in my lifetime. So we're passionate on social adjustment and our commitments to change and, and committed to taking action and briefing our board in September on those actions. We've talked to our board members. They want to serve on our advisory group on it. We have, we have a moment, we have the pull. And this is, if, if we miss this opportunity, it will not come again. So that's, that's a huge um, positive in my mind in terms of just having an ability to make meaningful change. In terms of, you know, just dealing with um, everybody working remotely, you know, it's hard. We do have an employee assistance program we provided, we provided remote, um, you know, capability for our employees to meet with mental health providers, to talk with employee assistance staff who can say, hey, I'm trying to work and I have three kids running around the house. I feel massively stressed. I don't know what to do. You know, we're trying to engage uh, our employees as much as possible to say, don't feel alone. We're here to support you. And the most important thing that we've learned is you know we need to be incredibly flexible not care what time people get their work done you know do as little in terms of meetings and phone calls that are mandatory as you can and we found people have been incredibly productive so another thing i'm doing um, is is presenting uh to our board on covid um on the 27th of july and talking about the future of work and what needs to be different as a result of this experience that we've all had. I think our employees have learned a lot, we've learned a lot, and not stepping back and saying, okay, what did we think was impossible before that we know is possible? And how do we make that available when there's not a crisis that's, that's forcing it? And so we're very much looking at a, a, a different approach to how people work. And we're a pretty, you know, United Technologies and Otis are pretty kind of old school corporate environment. So this is huge movement um, our, on our part. And I always think when I, I talk to people about leaving fingerprints, I think our change commitment on social justice and our ability to change the future of work, if I can leave those two finger, fingerprints and make it really different, those are things I can be really proud of in terms of uh, my time in this job. That is fantastic. I mean, we are so fortunate to have all of you ladies leading our organizations, leading in this time, right? So the, the idea that there's so many things happening, so many changes happening in real time. We have phenomenal women like you running these organizations and we can feel confident that we'll get through on the other side of this whole because you're caring, you're empathetic, you're strong, you're concise, and you're amazing rock star women. I mean, we're, we're very fortunate to have been able to spend time with you um, this afternoon. We have like two minutes. Um, I just got a cue that we could run over just a tad bit. So I'm gonna ask you, this is gonna be our, our, our lightning round. Um, really quick questions. So we received a question um, from one of our attendees and they're asking, as leaders, we have a great responsibility to advocate for our staff, coworkers, and support them as we lead by example. How do you balance taking care of yourself and your own families, just as you describe taking care of others? What do you do for self-care? So um, if anyone could just jump in and answer that question first, that would be fantastic. What do you do for self-care? For me, is working out. Mm -hmm. I, 
I find a great amount of stress relief in that, uh, a great amount of time to reflect and think, and it's good for you. Fantastic, working out. Any other? For me, for me, it's making sure I have the right balance. It's really easy to get sucked into working all the time and not, not step away, and especially when you're working remotely. So like creating some boundaries where it's like, this is family time. And I tell my team in the end, when we're all dying, we're not gonna be holding the hand of our, the company we worked for. We're gonna be holding the hand of the, the friends and families that have been part of our lives and investing in those relationships and making sure to make a conscious decision to do that and find the time for it is really important. Fantastic. My two dogs. Spending time with Leo and George. <laughs> They're gonna take care of I have Bella. Uh, they, don't care. <laughs> they don't care what they want, they want, and they want it when they want it. So that's how we run. <laughs> okay, another question that came through um, is all about aging gracefully. So one of our attendees want to know, can you comment on the changes that you've experienced in your leadership interactions as you've aged? So as you've gotten older and your own careers have you gotten older um more mature in your in your roles have that changed your leadership style at all i i would say for me yes i now don't defend my decisions i ask people to just look at the results and that's that there you go lori <laughs> yeah definitely i mean i think I, I i feel like what i've learned is life is a journey your career is a journey and the longer that you have in it the more that you learn, the better you can become in terms of having different points of view and different perspectives. So instead of worrying about being too old or, you know, ha you know, worrying about that, really take all that you have learned and you have brought on the journey and bring that full self to everything that you do. Um, it, it, in a way, it takes away a lot of the fear that you might have had earlier in your career about making a mistake or about, you know, getting sideways with someone. I mean, I'm always number one about being respectful, but not being afraid to drive the change that, that you think is necessary. So for me, it's a blessing. Not always when I'm trying to <laughs> ski with my kids or write, <laughs> but in my career, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's more experience and that's a good thing. Yeah. Great. I have to run to run another meeting, but I, um, I agree. I, I find as I get older and I'm, I'm like <laughs> mid career right now, I look younger than I am. Um, <laughs> it, I forgive myself a lot more. So I'm not as harsh on myself. I, I don't, I, if I make a mistake, I mean, we'll try to fix it the next day. Uh, there's no balance. There's just life. I just have to figure out day by day how I'm going to be the best me. And if I'm not that day, I'll try to do it the next day. I mean, you can't, yeah. you can't dwell on that. And I used to, and I don't anymore. But thank, thank you all. You. I have to run. Thank you, Elise. And finally, Bye. Martha, do you have any comments on that question? I do. I mean, I think, look, there's appropriate... Um, there's appropriate things at every stage. Imagine if you acted the same at two years old as at 20, as at 40, et cetera. It's not possible. It's not, it's not real. And so that's okay. I think it's appropriate at different times of your development and uh, you learn more, uh, you do better, you apply those learnings and you're different and you, you, you should be different. I mean, if I think if you're not different, you're not learning. You're growing, yeah. Good. Well, we can are. I really one, can I just add oh. one thing? Because when I was when I was at Aetna, they asked us as part of a, a, a woman to write a letter to our younger selves. And many of you may have seen this, and I really didn't want to do it, but I, I finally did because I, I'm compliant. And I took a lot of time to think about this letter to my younger self. And I wrote it. And then I thought, you know, what am I going to do with this? I really love this letter, but what am I going to do with it? And what I did was I gave it to my children. Because like, here's what I learned through this career. And it, it's all my best thinking about that. And so I think all of us should take that opportunity to keep writing letters to our, our younger self, and then sharing those learnings in a way that's practical with people that we can help. I love that idea. And unfortunately, we are truly out of time. Um, <laughs> 
But I want to thank our panelists for joining us today. You all are phenomenal women, and we're so grateful for you all to be associated with UConn, but also leading the organizations that you are leading. I want to thank each attendee for tuning in today, for your participation, for your energy. Women are breaking professional barriers each and every day, and I hope that you leave this conversation feeling more positive, having a renewed sense of hope and solidarity with women in their careers. I really like the idea that behind every successful woman, there's a tribe of other successful women cheering them on right behind them. So please know that you all have women cheering you on behind you. So we encourage you to um, form your tribe, find people that can support you and, and have your back as you continue to navigate and navigate in this, in, this, uh, in this career journey. So please join us for future programming um, as we continue to highlight inspiring leaders from our Yukon Nation. We are super proud of our Yukon Nation and these beautiful alumna that have taken the time to be part of our panel today. So thank you so much and we hope you have a great day and a, and a fabulous uh, rest of the week. Thanks so much. Thanks, India. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Bye. Bye. Bye.